Hello and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this program today we'll be discussing the growing problem facing many uh, Jewish students at our universities, including Holocaust denial posters being given out at our universities. <laughs> Warm welcome to the program. And my guest today is uh, Pastor Mike Fryer from Father's House, all the way up in North Wales. Uh, Mike, it's great to have you back on the Middle East Report. It's great to be here, Simon. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. You're doing a great job, and thank you for all that you're doing. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I think, uh, Mike, we had a controversial program uh, when we uh, last did a program discussing the role of Christians and the role they played in the Holocaust. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, I think we have got. Uh, a controversial program today, so I expect nothing less from you. <laughs> yeah. uh, but also, you've uh, the Father's House has been uh, growing, and you've moved to new premises up in North Wales, which is fantastic. So, do you want to tell our, our viewers how the Lord has been blessing the ministry that you're involved in? Yes, what we've done is we've bought two industrial units in D side and shot in D side, and we're, they're, they're quite. Uh, basic industrial units but we're we've had planning permission now to put windows in them to put uh, extra rooms in them for teaching suites we've uh, we're building a sanctuary inside uh, one of the units and we've got offices now which are working uh, full time in promoting the scriptures obviously promoting the gospel but also promoting support for Israel and uh, showing people that you can have a charismatic spirit filled uh, congregation that keeps the sabbath and the feasts and uh, so we're promoting that message as well because we feel that's also very important. Fantastic. So just want to encourage any of our viewers, if any of you are up in the uh, northwest or you are in the region of North Wales and you're looking for a fellowship to belong to, then I can highly recommend a Father's House and particularly under the leadership of Mike Fry. It's a fantastic place. So just Thank a little you, plug Simon. there for you. Thank you I for think that. It's important. <laughs> uh, I really want to talk about uh, today's program because the issues we're facing today are, I, I, I sense... A sense they're unprecedented uh, and it reminds us sadly of the era of the 1930s particularly how um, our, our academic institutions now are dangerous for Jewish students or for Israeli students who come over here and study to the extent that we're seeing an escalation in the rise of anti-semitism on, on our university campuses including our universities um, so really want to ask you, because you're very much involved in um, a dispute at the moment with SOAS University, that's a school for Oriental and African Studies, uh, in which their students have declared that Zionism is a form of racism and they banned any speakers that would talk passionately on behalf of Israel. Can you explain yes. really what's happening at SOAS? At SOAS, is, SOAS is an example of uh, a, a number of students who are coming together and speaking against Israel and not accepting the idea of Israel being a bona fide state. So last week, so our students got together and, and proposed, made a proposal that they would not accept anybody speaking at the university who is pro-Zionist because they're saying that Zionism is extremism. And that creates hatred towards the Jewish students at the, at the university. And, uh, and, and that hatred coming from other students is not only at SOAS, but in other places. So, um, so it is, SOAS is an example of what's happening in the mainstream universities across the country. And I've written to SOAS and, and made the point that every biblically-based Christian is a Zionist because the, the prophecies speak about Jews returning to the land of Israel, which was promised to Abraham and his descendants forever. And that there will come a time, and we're living in that time, when Jews will go back. So, so our, my point in, in uh, writing to Soas, to uh, the Professor Welby at, the, at, that, at Soas, is to ask him, is he all, are the students also barring Christians from speaking at the university? And are they barring any uh, uh, views about Zionism being taught in the university? Because Zionism is a legitimate Jewish and Christian narrative. 
So I'm waiting for a reply there. I've asked if I can hire a room in the university, speak about Zionism, and, um, and, and just to see if the, I can get a place in there to, to speak about our faith and the Jewish faith being um, uh, focused on the return of the Jews back to the land of Israel. And that's where we're at at the moment. But, but the idea of uh, hatred being spoken in universities is, is not new. Last year, there were 41 anti-Semitic attacks in the UK connected to uh, uh, Jewish universities and, and attacks which took place in universities. That's quite high, that number of 41. It's an increase on the previous year. As you know, anti-Semitism has increased throughout the UK last year upon previous years. So. My, I have to really ask you, I know this was um, organised by uh, many of the students at SOAS University, so obviously taking a very much of a kind of Arab position a against Israel. Um, but surely this is something that the principals of the university should actually, um, should actually prevent from happening, because essentially this is a threat to academic freedom of expression. And ultimately, then, if our, if our students are not free to learn and have that freedom to invite different speakers from on different subjects from different areas, then you close down any debate or any discussion on this one, which potentially is a, a damaging threat to our own very democracy and our way of life. Well, of course, it comes from leadership and, and, and what leadership think in, in, in our universities. Um, influences the students so if you have professors and lecturers who are anti-israel they're going to speak of, of an anti with an anti-israel narrative which is going to soak down to the students and i can give you an example in hungary in 1919 that's 14 years before the before the reich in germany took control uh, professors in the universities in hungary spoke against jewish students in their universities and actually set a quota and as a result of that, the students began to hate the Jewish, other Jewish students. And just 14 years later, it was uh, Jewish students were banned from universities in Hungary. And Hungary became a nation that actually allowed 400,000 Jews to be slaughtered by the Reich. So, so what we teach our students has an effect on, on the future. And I. And, and I can give you examples of where Hope University in Liverpool, in their social services department, they take students from there to the Palestinian areas in Israel and, and brainwash the students to believe that Israel is an occupying force. I can quote some of the statements that those students have made. Uh, and and it's, a, a, it's because of the lecturers and because of the professors in those universities teaching anti-Israel rhetoric that causes the students to think maybe it is right, maybe Israel is an occupying force, maybe uh, Zionism is extremism, maybe uh, the things that we hear about Israel are true and therefore we don't want those speakers in our universities. And as a result of that, the Jewish students in those universities are vilified because simply they are Jews and connected to Israel. I mean, uh, it just makes me think to uh, back at my time at uh, the University of Manchester 20 years ago. And uh, I was very much involved in the uh, JSOC, which was the Jewish Union there. And I mean, the, universe, the Jewish people then had huge problems then with, uh, well, I'm just going to call it what it is, the uh, Islamic Society trying to ban the Jewish Union because of its association with, uh, with Israel. Um, but they did that as a pretext in order to take over the Students' Union, to have halal food, to get rid of the student bar. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that was a problem over 20 years ago uh, at my university. So to think that things have now have got much worse now that Jewish students don't actually feel very protected anymore, um, and particularly Israeli students who come over here to learn at our universities. Because of uh, the, the British mandate, many Israelis come over and study British law because yeah. it's very similar to Israeli law right. um, to get them an understanding. Now, isn't it a very damning indictment on our universities if Jewish and Israeli students feel threatened just because they're Jewish? Of course it is. Of course it is. But we've got within our academia uh, people who hate Israel. We've got, we've got from the Islamic community, but also from, from uh, the far left and far right, academics who teach that Israel is an occupying force, that Israel is this beast that, um, that they portray it to be. And it's those who, who uh, are leading the way for anti-Semitism. It's not the students. If the students were taught that Israel was 
in, in fact, a, a nation that actually gives rights to Arabs living in the land, a nation that actually raises the quality of living, gives justice to the poor, then that, that narrative would go through to them and they may think differently about their Jewish students. But actually, it's the other way around. Lies are being taught to the students. They believe those lies, as is happening at SOAS. And in Hope University is another example where the, where the students are being told that Israel is an occupying nation. And, and the, the wall there is an apartheid wall, not a security wall. So, so the, the, these leaders, these professors, the lecturers have an agenda. And what they're doing, they're doing what they did before the war, is to sow hatred into the hearts of younger people. So in 20 years' time, those younger people who will become the lecturers and the professors in those universities will carry on teaching this hatred. And that's what happened in Holocaust, that's exactly what happened in 1933. Students were barred from universities in Germany. And by 1939, uh, Jewish students were barred. Now, by 1939, those uh, Gentile students had grown to be officers in the army. They'd grown to be the policemen in the, in the units who went out to kill Jews. And, and it's, it's a program of educating the young so that they will manifest hatred and even kill Jews in the future unless we stop it. So we must challenge places like SOAS. It's not right to allow them to carry on allowing their students to, to make uh, uh, declarations such as... A, Zionism is extremism. Zionism is simply allowing Jews to live in the land of Israel. That was promised to them biblically, but also politically. And we remember that in this year because of the Balfour Declaration. Absolutely. Well, well said there. Um, Mike, no, no, one thing does, does concern me, and, and this is the kind of cynical education that, that um, so many of our students at university level are receiving. Um, the fact that these students will go on, like you said, to become professors. They will go on and fill the professional classes. Some of them will go into government. And also, some of them could even then become our future leaders. Now, if they have a distorted view on Israel um, because of the teaching that they've had at university, particularly amongst the social sciences, um, doesn't this then have a profound impact on on the way that they would look at life and the way that they will look at Israelis and, and look at the conflict to realize actually um, the truth on the other side. The freedom of expression is only found in Israel. That's why Israeli universities are flourishing. That's why yeah. Israeli technology is flourishing because there is so much academic freedom in Israel, mm. which is unparalleled compared to the rest mm. of the Middle East. Yeah, you're absolutely right. What we teach our children has an effect on our future, doesn't it? And, and, and we are teaching them lies here in the UK. I'll give you an example again. A student from Liverpool went out to Israel with a, with a tour, a program tour from the university. And when she came back, she made a report that talked about uh, refugee camps in Israel amongst the Palestinians. She talked about living in Tal or staying in Tolkan in Israel. As it, and, and she says that was a refugee camp. Well, there, there isn't a refugee camp in Israel. But, but the way that she's been taught and made to understand what's happening there, the, the, the people are oppressed, etc., has caused her to come back and speak about, about Tulkan being a refugee camp. And actually, I've got a quote here from what she wrote. And because it's the social services department, obviously, you're going to look at uh, issues such as uh, health and well-being of people living in Israel and connecting it to people living here. She says in her report, she said, I would urge anyone curious of how occupation impacts on communities' health and well-being to join the social work department on this life-changing trip. Now, the truth is that actually Israel lifted the standard of living for Arabs in Gaza and on in Samaria and Judea, which is known as the West Bank today, they lifted the standards for ordinary uh, Arabs between 1967 and 2000. And the deprivation that's caused uh, at the moment in those areas is caused by the Palestinian Arab leadership who are divesting millions of euros yearly and not giving it to their people to, to sustain a high quality of life. So the, the story is twisted and changed around. And of Sorry. course... That happened before Holocaust, you know, d d that Jews were a, a danger to our nation. That's what Germany said, and Austria said the same. 
Of course they weren't. Jews were a blessing to the nation. But if a leader or a professor or an academic writes that story, then students are going to believe it. And, and, and we've got to stop this. We've got to actually say to our universities, if you want to promote lies and hatred, then we're going to campaign to stop you being funded to quote those lies. Because it, it, it has an effect on peace for the future. We want our Jewish students to, to grow and accomplish the things that they've been called to accomplish in a healthy, free environment. Because you know what? It's the Jewish students who go on to create medical help for us, you know, to create IT stuff. They created the, the mobile phones for us, computers, healthcare, beyond anything that any Arab nation has created. So we want to give them freedom so that they bless us. Absolutely. in our nation absolutely the best lawyers i worked as a policeman for the best lawyer in the country lord alex carlisle he was great he went on to to to, to direct how we protect our country as the leader of the uh, the terrorism department in government an amazing jewish lawyer a, f a son of a holocaust survivor mm. now we want to give freedom to jews to help us in our society but if we don't stop this hatred in our universities, then in 20 years' time, we're going to have more lecturers who are going to speak and vilify Israel and vilify the Jew. We're going to have more people in government, as you quite rightly say, who are going to vilify Israel. And uh, Eric Pickles, I've got a quote from Eric Pickles, who is the community um, uh, minister, isn't he? I think you he know Eric he, he was. He, he was, was, yeah. He's, he's now yeah. the uh, Prime Minister's special envoy on post-Holocaust issues. Ah, okay. right, okay. Well, you know him quite well. I know you know I'm, him I've quite well. Him he said times, this. Yeah. He said this recently. He said, there is a deep-rooted problem in our universities that must be wiped out. And he's talking about uh, anti-Semitism. And he says it must be wiped out. So I think f uh, uh, for us as, as Christians, because we have the same scriptures regarding Zionism, and, I, I, and Zionism is not a dirty word, we should get together as a Christian community in the UK and say this is far enough. Our universities are places in which there is, should be freedom of speech. There should be access to the truth. And we should be asking for our own theologians to get into those universities to teach that Zionism is a valid Christian and Jewish uh, concept. Absolutely. Let's, let's have a look now at uh, one man who was born to hate, but now has changed his position. I was born to hate Jews. It was part of my life. I never questioned it. I was not born in Iran or Syria. I was born in England. My parents moved there from Pakistan. Theirs was the typical immigrant story. Moved to the West in the hope of making a better life for themselves and their children. We were a devout Muslim family, but not extremist or radical in any way. We only wished the best for everyone. Everyone except the Jews. The Jews we believed were aliens living in stolen Muslim land. Occupiers who were engaged in a genocide against the Palestinian people. Our hatred Therefore, was justified and righteous, and it made me and my friends vulnerable to the arguments of radical extremists. If the Jews were as evil as we had always believed, mustn't those who support them, Christians, Americans, and others in the West, be just as evil? Beginning in the 1990s, speakers and teachers at mosques and in schools began to endlessly repeat this theme. We were not Western. We were not British. We were Muslims, first and only. Our loyalty was to our religion and to our fellow Muslims. We owed nothing to the Western nations that welcomed us. As Westerners, they were our enemies. All of this had its desired effect. At least, it did on me. It changed the way that I saw the world. I began to see the suffering of Muslims, including in Britain, as the fault of Western imperialism. The West was at war with us, and the Jews controlled the West. My experience at university in Britain only enhanced my increasingly radical beliefs. Hating Israel was a badge of honor. Stage an anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian rally, and you were sure to draw a large, approving crowd. While at university, I decided the protests and propaganda against Israel were not enough. True jihad demanded violence. So I made plans to join the real fight. I would leave college and join a terrorist training camp in Pakistan. But fortunately for me, 
fate intervened in a bookstore. I came across a book called The Case for Israel by Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz. The Case for Israel? What case could there be? The title itself made me furious, and I began to read the pages almost as an act of defiance. How ill-informed, how stupid could this guy be to defend the indefensible? Well, he was a Jew. That had to be the answer. Still, I read. And what I read challenged all of my dogmas about Israel and the Jews. I read that it wasn't Israel that created the Palestinian refugee crisis. It was the Arab countries, the United Nations, and the corrupt Palestinian leadership. I read that Jews didn't exploit the Holocaust to create the state of Israel. The movement to create a modern Jewish state dated back to the 19th century and ultimately to the beginnings of the Jewish people almost 4,000 years ago. And I read that Israel is not engaged in genocide against the Palestinians. On the contrary, the Palestinian population has actually doubled in just 20 years. All this did was make me angrier. I needed to prove Dershowitz wrong, to see with my own eyes how racist and oppressive Israel really was. So I bought a plane ticket. I would travel to Israel, the home of my enemy. And that's when everything changed. Everything. What I saw with my own eyes was even more challenging than what Dershowitz had written. Instead of apartheid, I saw Muslims, Christians and Jews coexisting. Instead of hate, I saw acceptance and even compassion. I saw a raucous, modern, liberal democracy, full of flaws, certainly, but fundamentally decent. I saw a country that wanted nothing more than to live in peace with its neighbors. I saw my hatred melting before my eyes. I knew right then what I had to do. Too many people on this planet are consumed with the same hatred that consumed me. They have been taught to despise the Jewish state. Many Muslims by their religion, many others by their college professors or student groups. So here is my challenge to anyone who feels this way. Do what I did. Seek out the truth for yourself. If the truth could change me, it can change anyone. I'm Kasim Hafiz for Prager University. Don't know about you, but I found that uh, very encouraging mm. and very uh, inspirational. And it just shows you that uh, the truth, and uh, this is what we have on this program, is the truth about Israel. Uh, I was very impressed with that. That's why I wanted to uh, show that uh, excellent presentation uh, about uh, you know, a Muslim British Muslim student, went to university, went to mosque. This he was indoctrinated with hatred towards Israel, and uh, he went to Israel, read the case for uh, the book, the case for Israel, saw Israel for itself, changed his mind. <coughs> so isn't it imperative then, really, that um, our university students have a better understanding of Israel by even maybe even going to Israel themselves to see. Uh, how great Israel was, because in the 60s and 70s, so many British students, after they finished university, uh, went out to Israel and volunteered on the, on the kibbutzes yeah. and the, uh, the, the farms and the moshavs in Israel and got to know Israel uh, that way. That's right. Really important that education is, is education of truth. Uh, and you, you use the word indoctrination. We can't indoctrinate our young people in any way on either side, but we have to show them the truth, and the truth is... Basically, it's exactly what uh, th th we've just heard is that Israel is a, is a nation of compassion. Yeah, it does have flaws. Every nation has flaws. But it's not an oppressive, aggressive uh, imperial regime. It's, it's a democratic country. It, it, its government is, is, is a government of democracy. But the Arab nations don't want that nation to exist. And Arab money is coming into our university so that our students will be indoctrinated and, and will be taught differently because that's part of the war of the Arab nations against Israel is, is the indoctrination and the teaching of hatred through university so that the next generation will continue with the anti-Israel, anti-Zionism that is endemic in our country today in, in, in academia. So... Yeah, you're right. It's, it, we have to teach truth. We have to not indoctrinate, but have to, have to take people to Israel to see what it's like, to see Arabs working with Jews, to see Arabs uh, prospering in Israel. There's, uh, there's Arabs in the Knesset, Arab MPs or, or MKs. There's no apartheid there. 
but the students here are taught that there is. Now that would, if you're taught that a country is an apartheid country and a, it's a country that oppresses the poor, are you going to want to riot against or, or protest rather, not riot, but protest? Mm. Yes, of course you are. So these students, many of them are doing, they're, they're protesting because they really believe that Israel is a, an oppressive regime. And that's why they're protesting. And all young people want to protest against injustices. We all are against injustice. But they believe that Israel is an unjust nation, so they're protesting. What we need to do is, as you say, is to get them to understand the truth. Actually, Arab nations are oppressive. Arab nations oppress women. Israel doesn't. Israel has equal rights for women. Does Saudi Arabia? Does Iran? Does Iraq? Does God, is there equal rights for women in Gaza, in the West Banks, Judea and Samaria? No, there aren't. Our students need to know that, that in Gaza, you, a woman can't go out to the beach and sunbathe in a bikini. Why aren't we telling these students that? Why aren't we teaching them that Israel is a free state? And that actually, if Israel was governed by the Palestinian Authority today, that women would not be allowed to work in certain occupations. That actually, they wouldn't be able to go into to, to professions, uh, in many professions. They wouldn't be able to, to, if, to do certain things because of the, the, the laws surrounding, Sharia law surrounding women's rights. So... We need to teach the truth. And the only people who can do that are our academics. Now, the academics have the choice because they know what the truth is because they, they, they often have been to Israel to have a look. They know what the story is, but they are so filled with anti-Semitism and hatred, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, that actually they want to distort the truth and teach these young students of ours, because these students are our students, to hate the Jewish students, and to hate Israel. And let's not forget, those Jewish students are our students in our nation. We have to protect them as we have to protect all students. And the protection that we should give them is a protection that allows the truth to be taught. And let them decide, but let's teach them the truth. Absolutely. Let's uh, remind ourselves of some of the challenges that uh, Israeli academic speakers face at our own universities and the hostility Jewish students face when they stand up for Israel on campus. And that happened at uh, University College uh, London only a few months ago. And uh, it's outrageous that uh, Israeli speakers are not given an opportunity to speak. And instead, we see the Palestinian supporters there who are students shouting, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. And effectively, that's incitement to genocide. Um, I have to ask you, Mike, because uh, since Theresa May's become our, our prime minister, she's been uh, very, very good at really clamping down 
on anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic activities to the extent now that she's adopted the new working definition of anti-Semitism uh, in which now anyone who says that Israel is a racist state, Israel has no right to exist, then that is a classification uh, for the new term of anti-Semitism. Uh, do you think that any way that, um, that some of these students or some of these people behind so much hatred against Israel can actually be prosecuted under the law? Well, I think under the law, the, the law sets out that if you're, if you have, uh, uh, if you speak against Israel as a, as a state and, and call for its annihilation, then that's incitement to hatred, and, and you break, you commit an offence. But in practice, what's happening is the police are not recording those crimes. We were in Edinburgh last year, as you know, you were there when a large group of pro-Palestinian demonstrators were calling for the destruction of Israel from the river. The, talking about the, the, the River Jordan to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, for the, the annihilation of the nation of Israel. And they were chanting that all day outside a peaceful Jewish meeting, a meeting for Israel. People were making complaints about that to the police. And I was recording those complaints. As a result of that, I made a request to uh, Edinburgh Police to see how many of those complaints were being investigated even though they were reported by letter and had been reported verbally to officers at the scene, Edinburgh Police came back to me and said that actually that none of those complaints had been recorded. So although we have the law, we don't have its implementation because I don't think the police take it seriously enough. You know, if, so we've got to put pressure on our police service as well to put pressure on, and I'm an ex-Bobby, I know exactly how it works. If the police aren't encouraged to record the, court, the crime and deal with those who uh, incite hatred on our streets, then it's not going to happen. Even if Theresa May does uh, bring about law changes, the implementation of those changes have to be enforced. And, and she's done a marvellous job, actually, with, in with including uh, Zionism in the definition. But actually, we need to get that fed down to the grassroots within our police service. And I'm still pursuing those complaints in Edinburgh. But I can tell you that if, if people are not strong in making those complaints to the police, the police will not deal with them. So if, if the viewers are experience uh, uh, hatred, particularly anti-Semitism, and they do complain to the police, make sure they follow it through. I just encourage them to do that. Absolutely. I think you raise a, a really uh, a very important point, Mike, and I, and I think that we can all be um, advocates for Israel in a different way, and, and that's to stamp out the rise of Jew hatred wherever we see it. Now, you know, I was at the same kind of meeting. It was the International Shalom Festival, which was um, a celebration of uh, Israeli arts and Israeli performists and musicians yeah. um, as part of the Edinburgh Fringe. And, and actually then walking to the venue, you had to walk through these Palestinian protesters, and uh, they were pretty vile. Now, they made a silly mistake in actually recording the whole entire demonstration. It's up on YouTube. It's easy to find. Um, uh, but when they actually start chanting hatred against Israel, like shame on you, you can live with that. But when they start shouting free, free Palestine and that Palestine will be free from the river to the sea, don't they realize that there's a Jewish state in between that? And that uh, if you want Palestine so-called to be free, then the only way that's going to happen is through genocide of destroying the one and only Jewish state in the Middle East. So do they actually know what they're actually chanting? Uh, of course they do. Uh, you, you were there, I was there. Oh, and, yeah. and I've been involved, I was involved in the miners' strike, the farmers' dispute in Anglesey. I when thought it first my, started. my dad was involved in the miners' strike as well. Was he? So, yeah. Right, okay. He was a police officer as well. So right, right, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So we know what hatred's like. Tox the riots, I was there. We know what hatred mm. sounds like. And when we went to Edinburgh, those, those protesters were not protesting with placards and being very nice about it. They were angry. Oh, they were yeah. vicious. Yes. They were frightening Jewish people going into that meeting. Some people turned away from going in. They weren't allowed access, not because they're physical, physically stopped, but because of the hatred that mm. came out of the mouths of the protesters. Now, let's say that, that, that the police didn't consider that was hatred or anti-Semitism. It was certainly a breach of the peace, and it was certainly offences under the Public Order Act. So why weren't these people arrested? Why weren't they taken out of action? Frightening Jewish people going into a, a cultural 
event is a breach of the peace, comes under the Public Order Act. It's because our, the people who are in authority, of, uh, in the, who are implementing the law in our country, and those in academia are not willing to pursue the right course of action to stop this hatred on our streets. Don't forget Mosley in the, you know, in the middle of last century. He instigated riots yes, by yeah. just having people standing on the streets and chanting. The film clip we've just seen are students who hate Israel. Now, it just doesn't come from anywhere, that hatred. That hatred is planted in their hearts by uh, um, wrong teaching, by lies. And, and they are passionate and sincere in their protest. But it comes about because they've been taught that. And that's the whole thing about our education system. They've been taught that. I could just quote you one thing. Um, it's uh, in a book called The Third Reich in the Ivory Tower. A author called Stephen Norwood, an American, writes about academics in 1933 in America who went and traveled to Germany to, su to, to support the Reich in their implementation of anti-Jewish laws. And they went on ships that had SWAT stickers on them. These were academics in America, well-known, respected academics, and they brought back German anti-Semitism to America which resulted in America refusing to take in Jews just prior to the war, saving their lives on ships like the St. Louis. Absolutely. Those, those young people influenced Roosevelt to stop Jews coming in, so it has a long-term effect. Also, I want to raise one of the uh, very disturbing issues, and, and uh, just having to refer to my notes here, that um, uh, from the universities, uh, University College London, Cambridge University, Edinburgh University and uh, Glasgow University, um, some students have actually been giving out Holocaust denial leaflets to students. Um, I mean, this takes it to another level, doesn't it, Mike, um, to yeah. actually put out leaflets and disturbing cartoons uh, that question whether the Holocaust actually took place. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and if we look at Cambridge University and uh, yesterday had SWAT stickers on the walls, they found SWAT stickers on the walls, but this Holocaust denial issue is something that started last year in our universities, and they are they are posters and leaflets. I've got some of them here. I don't know if you've got them, uh, got them Simon, now. but I've got them here. They're, they're awful. They actually um, say, deny the Holocaust took place, but also they revise the Holocaust, the, the two things, the, the, this denial, but there is also revisionism. It's, and for the viewers, the revisionism is where they play down the numbers killed in Holocaust or the way that Holocaust was carried out. They are fictitious, they're lies, but they're as a result of a, a, an agenda to diminish the rights of the Jewish students to speak about their history because Jewish students now are frightened to speak about Holocaust because there's going to be this forceful denial that takes place that Holocaust never happened. And, and these leaflets and posters actually are frightening for the Jewish students. So let's have a look at um, some presentations. Uh, the first one is on Holocaust denial and the next one features uh, Deborah Lichstadt uh, in which they've made a film about her called Denial in which um, she went to court uh, against David Irving who uh, is a well-known Holocaust denier and won the case that Holocaust did happen. In July 2015, Romania passed a law officially criminalizing Holocaust denial. 16 other countries have also passed legislation effectively outlawing the practice. But elsewhere, even heads of state are deniers, like Iran's ex-president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. In fact, one survey showed that up to two-thirds of the world hadn't heard of or denied facts about the Holocaust. So how is that possible? What is Holocaust denial? From 1941 to 1945, Adolf Hitler's Nazi regime carried out the systematic genocide of about six million Jews and millions of others considered undesirable. Nearly all historians, survivors, and even ex-Nazis confirmed that Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and others were murdered through the use of concentration camps and gas chambers. Yet, Holocaust deniers, who prefer the term revisionists, argue that the Holocaust either did not happen or was significantly overblown. Many deniers, like the former head of the Muslim Brotherhood, suggest that the myth of the Holocaust is simply a Jewish conspiracy designed to subjugate non-Jewish people. 
While they argue that their view is objective and unbiased, it's generally acknowledged that in most cases, Holocaust denial is a direct form of anti-Semitism. Additionally, deniers rarely dispute the non-Jewish victims of the Holocaust, and even acknowledge that there was systematic mass murder by the Nazis, just not of Jews. Generally, there's a focus on three primary arguments. The first is that the Nazis did not have a specific policy of exterminating Jews. This is predicated on the fact that no direct written order from Hitler exists. However, there is significant evidence in the form of letters, testimony from the Nuremberg trials, and even passages from Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. Two secretly recorded speeches were made in 1943 by the architect of the Holocaust, Heinrich Himmler. In them, he explicitly discusses the systematic extermination of the Jews. Deniers often argue over the meaning of the word extermination within the speech. Another assertion is that nowhere near six million Jews were killed during the Holocaust, often citing numbers closer to 300,000 or a million. Much of this is based on a single Red Cross publication listing 300,000 registered deaths of Germans and German Jews alone. This figure is misrepresented by deniers as accounting for all Holocaust victims. In 1979, the Red Cross responded to deniers and disputed these false claims. The final argument is that Nazis did not use gas chambers or extermination camps. In one famous case, a leading Holocaust denial organization put out a challenge offering $50,000 for proof that Jews were gassed at Auschwitz. In response, a Holocaust survivor submitted his experience of seeing his mother and two sisters led into gas chambers to be killed. When the organization refused to pay up, the survivor sued and won. During the trial, the judge declared Jews were gassed to death at Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland during the summer of 1944. It is not reasonably subject to dispute. It is simply a fact. Despite Holocaust deniers being regularly discredited, they continue to be supported by white supremacist, neo-Nazi, and anti-Semitic groups. Although they claim proof of a Jewish agenda, there's almost no debate as to the real reason that they attempt to deny the facts of the Holocaust. I couldn't believe that a professor from Emory University in Atlanta could find herself in the circumstance where a Holocaust denier is suing her uh, for libel in a British court of law, and therefore, if she doesn't go defend this, there would be a finding in a Western civilized court that says the Holocaust didn't happen. I just couldn't believe that that would be possible. And this is what I had said to my students when I came back from the trial, that you can't fight every battle, but there's certain battles you can't turn from. But in our own small way, we each get a chance to challenge wrong. I will not debate you, not here, not now, not because ever. You're gone. I think Emery was the height of integrity and the height of support. I couldn't have asked for better. And I think it was important for Emery to support me also for the message it transmitted to students that the university believed in what I was doing and believed I was doing the right thing. We were making a film about Holocaust denial, which we thought is important because it's about truth and lies, but we never thought it would have the contemporary punch that it does. When you take a look at people trying to make their own truth today, and it seems to be happening more and more, that to us is what makes this a universal story. What I want my students to know, you know, if, you, if it's your opinion, can you back your opinion up with facts? But if you can't, then it's just an opinion with no foundation. Or is it an opinion based on lies? But you can't have your own version of the facts. There was a very good article in the moment. My experience was that Emory supported me, and it was crucial that they supported me. It was crucial that they supported me for many reasons, but amongst them, to telegraph to the students that this is something, A, that they took seriously, and B, that there is a difference between truth and lies, that there's a difference between facts and fiction, and that they believe in supporting the faculty when they are morally engaged.
And uh, 10 years ago, I met uh, Deborah Lichstadt at an event in London, and uh, she gave me a book and uh, signed it, which was very nice of her. So it just goes to show that it's important that uh, people like Deborah Lichstadt stand up against this lies and against this hatred. Uh, I, I just think it's unbelievable, um, particularly when I've actually uh, my interviewed Holocaust survivors mm -hmm. who've went through the horrors of Nazism to survive that and then have their whole experience questioned mm -hmm. by those who hate the Jewish people by saying the Holocaust never took place um, is, is absolutely scandalous. So I just wonder why in this country that we don't have laws that prevent Holocaust denial or people mm -hmm. advocating Holocaust denial, whether on a media platform, social media platform, or even a, in a court of law. I, I don't think we've got the stomach to do that. I don't think the, our government want to see denial uh, legislation. In Austria and Germany, there is denial legislation, and Irving, actually, who denied the Holocaust in that, uh, in that trial, was arrested and put in prison in Austria because he denied, and that's a really good thing because it, our, our young people really don't know a lot about Holocaust. We've just done a survey in Liverpool during a Holocaust exhibition of 358 people, and nine people had not heard about Holocaust. So a Holocaust in the future will be easy to deny. But the truth of it is it existed. There is a, an encyclopedia going to be published in the next two or three years which shows that 42,000 camps, killing camps, existed within Nazi-occupied Europe during the war. So there is masses of evidence. But the thing about denial is it is connected to the genocide itself. There are Absolutely. eight stages in genocide. And the last stage is denial. The church denies its role in Holocaust today. Academics deny the academic role in Holocaust today. Nations deny their role. And, and what's being worked out in our society today is the eighth stage of genocide and denial of what happened in Europe during the 1940s, the 30s and 40s, is just part of that continuing genocide. So we have to stop it in our universities. We have to show these young students that actually it happened. You know, the, the, the killing fields did occur. And, and actually, if they continued to speak in terms of hating Israel and hating the Jews, there will be another attempt on the Jewish population of Europe and the Jewish population of Israel. So we have to turn things around, but it's a, it's a continuation of the genocide. And that's what we don't realize as a nation. And we don't realize as a church either that actually we, we need to combat uh, denial at every level in our society. Absolutely, because you know the one thing about the, uh, the show and Jewish people don't like to use the word Holocaust because it means sacrifice. Yes. So yeah. they preferred the word Shoah. Yes. Uh, which is great catastrophe and yes. you know, translate from yes. the Hebrew into the English. And that catastrophe ca still today casts a dark shadow over the Jewish people worldwide. Yes, you don't meet one Jewish family that doesn't know someone, a relative in their distant past yeah. that was actually murdered at the hands of Nazis. And this is something that still very much affects them today because they, uh, they're not complacent. This mm. is why Jewish people are so involved in politics because they know that they need to protect themselves and their community mm. from uh, universities. Um, such as these. Now, what is being done? I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're an ex-CID uh, uh, detective. What can be done to prevent, <laughs> for example, these leaflets going out at universities that actually deny the Holocaust and trying to influence other students to say the Holocaust never happened? And this is at our universities. It's just disgusting. Well, there's two things that need to be done. First of yep. all, we need denial legislation for the yep. future because deniers will gain momentum as less people understand the Holocaust. So we need legislation in place to say that denial, as it is in Austria and Germany, is an offence in this country, so that we stop denial. So people who issue leaflets and publicate, public, publicise denial literature can actually be arrested and brought before the courts and stopped. And secondly, the principals of all our universities need to ban the leafleting of denial posters, etc., and actually deal with the students themselves and bring them to book and say, Absolutely. we're not allowing this in our universities, we've got to stop it. So we need to get our academics to make decisions regarding truth again. And unless we do, we're going to allow them, and, and apathy will allow them to continue. So, so we must, as I'm doing with SOAS, ask the, the people at the top to deal with the issue, 
because it's their university. They're the top guys, and, and, and they have the power to stop students. We must try and get them to stop. And again, if, if universities don't do it, let's look at their funding. Because all we're doing is funding hatred if we're giving money to universities who are promoting denial and hatred. And it's our money. So we, as a particularly a Christian community in the UK, need to pressurize our government and, and support denial legislation and support uh, action to stop hatred being taught in our universities. Uh, finally, Mike, I think we're down to the last two minutes of the program. So what role can, uh, sorry, i give you 30 seconds. What role can our, um, our viewers play in confronting due hatred at our universities? Well, write letters campaign to your MP, do the things that, that we should have done in, in, in Europe in 1933 onwards. Let's not be apathetic like many of the churches and believers were before the Holocaust. Let's not get it that, allow it to get that far. Let's be active now. Let's be vocal. Let's be brave. Let's be courageous and, 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 and do the things that we need to do to stop this hatred. Mike, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest on today's Middle East Report, and I thank you for the moral clarity that you bring on these issues, particularly looking at the plight of uh, Jewish students and what's happening at our universities. So thank you. Thank you, Simon. Appreciate it. And I uh, just want to thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. Uh, you see there's something clearly wrong at our universities, and particularly when it comes down to students giving out leaflets denying the Holocaust is absolutely disgusting and outrageous, and this is something that we shouldn't tolerate or accept. So thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. Seven stars, his right hand. the earth preparing the way of the Lord reckoning the day when Israel will say Baruch Abba 